Monday. Oh, you, Lisa. It's been a blessing, that's for sure. Welcome, 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 everybody, to Mastermind Monday for Monday, June 13th. I cannot believe half the year is already uh, passed, and uh, we're looking at sunshine, certainly here on beautiful Cape Cod. This is our time of year, not to make you all jealous, but I sit listening to the warm weather people as I'm freezing in February <laughs> all the time. So thank you so much for joining us. I know your time is valuable. We really appreciate your time, and I am so excited this morning. Uh, for our very special guest, Debbie Yost, um, who's going to be sharing with us on systems. Towards the end of today's uh, session, which usually goes to about 1230, we are going to uh, let you know about some events that are coming up for the New England region, which we're very excited about, uh, including some future Mastermind Mondays that we have planned. But today, it's all about systems. And we have Debbie Yost, who has been continually named the queen of systems and she kind of loves that moniker and we love having her on for sure i mean everybody knows that um, the more systems you have in place the um easier life will be and probably the sounder you will sleep so uh debbie has been with us for about i think she's been a realtor for 40 two years 42 oh, years she started wow. when she was only she started when she was only two <laughs> So, you know, that's just how that works. Um, she um, is a, a very accomplished uh, realtor. She's a CRS instructor, of course. She also is a coach, uh, a mentor, and leads a team in Arizona. Her husband and her uh, have a brokerage. And so she comes to us with a ton of experience, but it's also continually in the trenches every day, which makes her an amazing resource for all of us. I can't wait to learn more about systems and hopefully we can bring you for even longer period to New England region. Uh, if not, a vir if certainly virtually for next year, people are continuing to come in, this is great. So I am going to um, mute myself, Debbie, and I, we just can't wait to share every moment and squeeze every moment of this 30 minutes out with you. Well, thank you very much. I'm gonna share my screen real quickly here and we'll get started. <gasps> Look at that. So I pulled today some of the content that we have in that eight hour systems will set you free class, which is something that I live every day. I am a real broker, I'm a broker owner. This is my team um, in Arizona and we're right between Phoenix and Tucson. You're gonna see on the slides down here, a link debbieyostcoaching.com forward slash systems 2022. A lot of the forms that I'll show you today are systems you can rip off and duplicate. They're right there, so grab it. You'll see that little link there all over. And uh, if we get to the end of this and I haven't shown you something, feel free to email me. There's my email address and I'm happy to send you something to, uh, to help you move along. Just put systems in the subject line so that I know what I'm answering real quickly. So let me move along. We'll just jump right in and I'm fine. If anybody has to interrupt me today, just use that chat box and I'm sure that Lisa or Christine will interrupt me. So do we realize this, especially as realtors, we never fully unplug from our jobs. And you know, a lot of us think we're going on vacation, but don't we actually wind up doing this the whole time? And of course, with market conditions, with the pandemic, with consumer confidence, with everything that's going on in the world, I know that sometimes I feel like this, my people feel like this. So I want you to realize that buying or selling a house is more stressful for the client than getting a divorce. That's really important to remember. The only thing more stressful is death of a spouse or child. So most people, if they're selling, they're also buying again, aren't they? They're not just selling and becoming homeless. So that stress level is exacerbated and we become therapists, don't we? So if we are taking care of our clients, we're really handling that stress that they have, plus we're juggling everything in our mind, it can be super stressful for us. And we can either burn out or we become numb to the client. You've, you've seen realtors like this that have been in the business for a while. So in our business, we create leverage with three things, people, systems, and technology. Okay, so the systems are the vision, what we want to have happen in every transaction. You know, sometimes people think that there are emergencies in our business. And in my mind, the only emergency is a fire. And that the client should be calling the fire department, not me. 
So if we put systems in place to run those things that happen over and over and over, we can leverage ourselves and reduce that stress. Ideally, then we introduce technology to run those systems. And then we, as our business expands, we can use people to run those systems. So I want you to think about this. If you do something more than once, you create a system. So I'll give you an example of one of the reasons why we became super systemized early in our career. We, uh, we used to have a computer guy come in in the middle of the night once a month and clean all the computers and upgrade them. And we had a, a staff changes, so we changed the security system, the alarm code, but we forgot to tell our computer guy. So at two in the morning when the alarm went off, because that's when he usually would go in and do all that work on the computers, we had to go down to the office at two in the morning with the police and, and let that guy do it. So we created a system for everything that we do more than once. So I want you to think about this. We do this every day, don't we? Staged, photographed, listed, marketed, and sold is a system. And we can break down just about everything that we do in our business in a very similar way. So just pause for a moment and look at this list. These are some of the things that we go over in that eight hour systems class. What systems are missing from your business? And I would love to hear a couple of ideas right now because I pulled some stuff that I think is really current, but what is really missing in your business? And if anybody wants to throw them out, I'm happy to take them. And if I can touch on them today, I will. Lisa, is there anything missing in your business? I'm just looking through, you know, I, I think for me, <laughs> there's the follow-up on the follow-up, like tracking referrals. I've started that. I, I kind of have a thank you at the end of the year. Like there's a couple of pieces of that, but 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 it's not, well, yeah, no, it's not systematized. So certainly tracking referrals would be a big one for me. Um, and then I hired a virtual assistant, the executive assistant who is helping me because I cannot get out of a paper bag with a system. I need to hire someone with that's high, high S, high C that will be able to, to, to help me plug in. So maybe you'll be talking about some of that also. Um, and Wait, the maybe we, we didn't even talk about this ahead of time, but absolutely referrals is one today that I'm going to definitely hit on because they're predicting that by 2025, nearly 50% of our transactions are going to be involving a hefty referral fee paid to a third party large company. So I would like to really reduce those outside referral fees that are growing and growing 35, 45, 50%. And so Perfect, we're gonna hit on that today. So this is something that people put off. They say they're gonna to get to it tomorrow. I think if you could just put three hours a week, one hour, three times a week into starting to build your systems, you're gonna see a huge difference. So you just gotta make that commitment. And a lot of it starts with time blocking because you've gotta create that one hour time period where you can focus on building these systems. So before we go into some specific examples, I want to remind everybody that these are the five highest dollar productive activities of a realtor. Lead generation is number one, and that's however you do it. Sometimes when I say lead generation, people think, oh my God, I'm talking about cold calling. I, I've never cold called or door knocked in my life. Maybe, well, I did one time. Maybe that's part of part of your lead generation strategy. It's not mine. Mine is being very visible in my community. Um, but lead generation is something that has to happen every single day. Number two is negotiating or saving a deal. Okay, if you've got an offer or you are in one of those situations where things are unraveling, that is a high dollar productive activity for you. Taking saleable listings. And I know that in the past two years, just about anything we could list would sell. And so I think I'm not going to ever say that we're shifting to a buyer's market right now, and we'll talk about that, but certainly we may need to be looking a little bit stronger at those listings and are they saleable. And then number four, working with qualified ready to buy buyers, and number five is planning and big picture visioning. And that's where we're starting today. I think when you build a system, you have to stop for a moment and say, in an ideal world, what is my vision of the client experience? 
what, how did I want them to go through this transaction? And you take it chunk by chunk and you create that vision. And then there's plenty of people on a virtual basis or a permanent uh, assistant that you have that can translate that vision into a system. So I thought today we'd really hit on some things that are happening in the market. So I'm getting this question no matter where I go, and I'm sure you are too. How's the market? And we sometimes just jump into answering without even thinking. Oh my God, it's so crazy. I've been working nonstop for 72 months, you know, or I put 47 offers last week and I only got one in, or we had 23 offers and we sold 100,000 over list. You know, we're just spouting. That's not what the client really wants to hear or what the person that asked that question wants to hear. When they say, how's the market? What they really want to know is what's my home worth and how is this a market affecting me? So the next time you hear that question, and I hear it no matter where I go, think about the answer that you want to give. And we, we answer emotional objections with fact, data, and logic. And when people are asking this question, how's the market? There's some emotion behind it. I hear what's happening with the stock market. You know, I know about inflation. I know about this. What's this really mean to me? So let's give our clients and our public some real factual data. There's lots of information that's out here. Um, I, I hope that you take a screenshot of this. You can all use this in all of your marketplaces. This is an interactive map um, that was put out by uh, CoreLogic. And you can see the chances over here of a price change. And you can see the little guide up here and what it means. So, you know, we put this in our newsletter that goes out. We have data that we can actually talk about. This is a report we have that we get weekly. We download information from the MLS, send it to real market reports for $50 a month. Per zip code, they create a weekly report. And I can sit down with a seller right now and say, look, you know, in the 400 to 499 price range, we have 47 active listings. Okay. Going on over here, this chart shows a 1.8 month supply of inventory. So down here, we're still overall in my, in Casa Grande, my market area, less than a month's supply of inventory. So consumer confidence is critical. That's what drives the market, right? So we've been having consumer confidence in a frenzy the last couple of years with prices increasing rapidly and crazily, right? What's happening right now? What message are we sending out on social media regarding market conditions? Are we using fact, data, and logic like Robert Little is in his newsletter and his social media marketing that he puts out? Or are we continuing to say, oh my God, I've worked 17 days without a day off. I wrote 300 offers to get one accepted. What's the message that we're putting out there? This came through just this morning as I was getting ready um, to jump on Zoom. This is a, a, a newsletter brought by RRC every day or every week. And this is what came out in the newsletter today. Some articles that you can tap into and reference. Housing inventory is still at a crisis level. You know, across, across the top 100 metro areas in the country, we have just two months supply of inventory. Over here, how a home purchase boosts consumer spending and how that spending magnifies in that local marketplace. And then the question, are home prices going to fall? So let's, let's all put out responsible information in our marketing and on social media instead of some of the things that are going out there right now. Now, I want to really bring this point home. I looked up in the Boston area, the New England area, to see if Open Door was there yet. I didn't see that they were there, but I promise you if they're not there now, they will be there soon. And you have plenty of other internet buyers, investors, hedge funds buying. Now, I have to tell you a little story that's personal. My husband and I bought this property, you can see this address up there, as a new construction 18 months ago, and we paid $235 for this house. This appeared in my mailbox because we have rental 
property, I'm getting two to four pieces of mail every day offering to buy one of my properties. I know that this market value right now for this property is 360. Look what they sent me. Your estimated offer between 342 and 418. Down here they say, why sell to open door? Get a competitive cash offer instantly, skip stressful home showings and prep work and choose the close date that works for you. So now think of me not as a knowledgeable real estate investor or a realtor, but a member of the public knowing that I bought this house 18 months ago for 230 and they're sending me an offer right now saying, I get cash right away. I don't have to have show, showings and I don't have to prep it and I can pick my closing date and look, they're gonna pay me between 342 and 418. So a normal person, what am I gonna do? If you saw the rest of this letter, there'd be a phone number or a website. I'm going on there, right? And I'm gonna find out more information. Here's the second letter that came in my mailbox that same day. Home Vesters, look at this. We buy houses at a discount, but when we buy them, you get cash and avoid most of the normal closing costs. You sell directly to us and there are no commissions. You sell your house as is, and you can close quickly if that's what you want. These investors are purchasing this property over and over and over. I know in the Phoenix marketplace, 30% of the sales last month involved not a home purchaser, but a large company like this. Wow, 30%? Yes, 30%. In October wow. of 2019, before the pandemic hit, 42% of the sales in October in the Phoenix marketplace, under 400,000, were purchased by an iBuyer or an investor. Okay, so why are we letting outside companies tell the public and tell our own clients what their home value is. If you get nothing out of this today, that's, it's that. It's our job to keep in touch with our clients and tell them what their home value is. So I'm gonna pop up this little um, piece of information here, homebot.ai. When I reference any kind of a product or software, I have no financial interest in it. We've been using this product called homebot.ai for about three years right now. Every month, once you set it up, the client will get something gone either to their email or their cell phone, wherever you set it up, and it will give them the estimated market value of their home monthly. It will give them all sorts of little calculators to play with. If you work with investors, they love it. So here's what I want my clients to get, the HomeBot app every month that gives yeah, value. Who do you put on that on that recipient list, Debbie? Which which of your groups of you in your sphere do you do that for? Everyone. Everyone. This is part of our closing system. When we close on a property that a purchaser has purchased, what we'll do is put the address, and we just need the property address, the cell phone, or the email address. We take a look at it, we, we put in their home value what they purchased it for, or if the appraisal came in higher, we'll put that. We put their loan amount and their interest rate. And so we put that data in there right away. Anybody I talk to that asks me how the market value is, how the market's doing, I say, you know, I've got this great little tool. When I get back to the office, I'll just set you up on it. Is that okay? Which phone number do you want it to come to or which email address? You can partner with a lender on this if you choose to, or you can just get it yourself. We do not partner with a lender because we want the client to call us if they're thinking about refinancing. This runs about $50 a month for 500 clients. I want our clients to get the information from us, okay? I would suggest that if you don't want to go right to their website and see how it works. If you send me an email afterwards with your property address, I'm happy to set you up on mine and you can get an idea of what that looks like. So shifting a little bit, um, I've had some calls in the last week from other realtors saying things like, oh my God, the house has been on the market eight days. What's wrong with it? Panic. There must be something wrong with a listing that's, that didn't sell in two days. I think that we may have to actually do some seller servicing as we move forward. 
So I'd like to suggest that you put something like this in place. It's a normal market update. Now, right now we're going 14 days after listing because things are pretty much still selling in less than a week in my market, but we're going to implement this again. It's a summary that goes to the client, the listing client. Where were the online views? We'll probably adjust this a little bit now that we're gonna start using it again. In the last two weeks and to date, how many people actually looked at your house online? Knowing that those are first showings and physical showings are second showings, right? We're gonna update the CMA. We're gonna say number of competing listings and escrow. We're gonna give a month's supply of inventory. We're gonna remind them how many offers they had. So again, this is data because right now consumer confidence is so wonky with everything that's going on in the world. We wanna give data. Now, I think I saw John Young in the list of folks that are on this webinar. And I know that he has an amazing spreadsheet that analyzes the net on multiple offers. I don't believe that the net is always the most important thing in an offer. So we use a multiple offer comparison sheet and this is in that list of uh, uh, documents that I told you you can rip off and duplicate on my website. We really wanna talk to the seller about the different buyers and it's not just the offer price, it's what kind of loan. It's do we really need concessions? What about the prior experience with the lender or the realtor? What are we dealing with in an appraisal contingency? And if they've waived it, do we really have proof that if that appraisal comes in low and they use up the cash to deal with that gap that they can still qualify? And so we really want to help the seller understand the differences in the offers. And frankly, for us, it helps us get organized. So when we have multiple offers, we do this all the time, just for us and also for the seller. So I hope you rip off and, and duplicate that, put that into play. I'm going to hit a couple of other things during the contract period, assuming we've accepted an offer. Are you sending at a minimum the critical dates checklist involved in a transaction? Do your clients know what their responsibility is? We do this every day. They don't. So it's, if you're not sending much, start with a critical dates checklist so that nobody skips anything that's required. Then that proactive communication that is so important lowers the stress level, okay? For the seller, preparing for the home inspection. Here are some things that you, you might wanna check before we get that inspector over there. You know, that creative wiring that's on the back patio, the inspector's probably not gonna like that. Let's set the seller up for a good inspection. I also wanna talk a little bit about the appraisal package. Do you have your package ready when the appraiser calls to schedule the inspection? That's when you need to have it ready. If you think about how appraisals are handled these days, the lender calls an appraisal management company who puts an order out to the appraisers on their panel. The appraisers are actually getting paid less these days, even though the appraisal costs more because there's an appraisal management company in there. So the appraiser goes into MLS, pulls up some data real quickly, and is making a decision how much data is available to hit this order easily. Are they going to have to do a lot of extra work or not? So when they've chosen, when they've accepted that order and they're calling you to schedule the appraisal, they're already ready to go. Okay, they're not going to drive back down to Casa Grande to go look and take a second set of pictures on other comps. So we create this package and have it ready as soon as we get an offer accepted. This form looks really boring, and it is because appraisers think in data, not in pretty pictures. So some of the things I really want to point out to, the, to you on this is recent upgrades made to the subject property. I'm sure you have invoices. That gives the appraiser data. Get those invoices about the recent upgrades. The feedback that you got. I mean, you can pull that right from a system like Showing Time if you're using it or another feedback program. Why do people buy in that neighborhood? And how many offers did you get? Now, if you had three or four offers, 
Are you proving that to the appraiser? We're taking the first page of all of those offers, redacting the buyer's name and just putting the first page of those multiple offers as an attachment to this document. So we're actually proving to the appraiser right up front the demand that we had. Why did the seller buy on this particular or choose this particular offer? Of course, sales and data used. That's what most realtors give. They don't give all the rest of this information. What's happening in that market? For me, I can tell them that we have Lucid not only here building electric cars, but expanding and doubling their plant, that we have a Kohler plant opening, that we have two Chinese chip manufacturers that are in here. So I can provide data on what's happening in the market and then any other information. And this goes to the appraiser as soon as they call to schedule that inspection. Since we've been using this process, we have very few issues on appraisal because we're showing the appraiser that we know our stuff and we're giving them the data. So as the market adjusts, um, you may wanna go into that kind of a phrase, uh, situation and use something like this. Now I wanna jump to something else, uh, closing gifts. This is something that Abby, Davidson does, Abigail Davidson does in the Santa Fe market. She already has all these great photos, right? So she's putting together a Shutterfly book. Very simple, $20, $25 expense. And she has a system for giving her seller an awesome closing gift. Wouldn't you like a gift like this as a seller when you've sold your beautiful house? And it's a system. You can see here's her team working on the marketing for all of this. She already has these photos. So why not just create a Shutterfly book right away? Now, I know all of you are CRSs are probably already doing this. Do you have a system to make sure that the settlement statement gets mailed to every buyer and seller who closed a transaction the previous year? If you have to go unearth all those settlement statements, it becomes a job. But if you have a system when you close a transaction to print a copy of that settlement statement, to print the letter that's going to go with it, that's what we do for buyer and for seller, no matter who we represented. Okay, we package this, we fold them, we put them in a, an addressed envelope, and they go in alphabetical order in a, a box that we keep. Why do we do that? Because sometimes a spouse will pass. I wanna be able to go pull that letter, rewrite the letter, re -ch change the address so that we're not sending that letter to the deceased spouse and, and kind of making everybody feel bad. The other reason we keep those envelopes unsealed is I might wanna put another piece of information about the market or something else in those. So those are ready to go. On January 2nd, those get dropped in the mail. Very easy system to do. And we send them to both parties in the transaction. And we do that because most clients get ignored after the closing. I'm sorry to say it, but that's the truth. And with a little bit of shift in market conditions, we're gonna have some agents dropping out of the business in the next couple of years. So it's, it's very possible that that client on the other side will get no support moving forward. I wanna talk a little bit for consistently requesting or receiving online reviews. This, is, this data is about two months old. It's from review trackers. These are the following, these are the sites that people go to most often before they'll visit a business. Google is number one. If you're not getting Google reviews right now, you're missing a great opportunity. Yelp is number two, although it's more uh, related to restaurants and travel. You can see where TripAdvisor comes in. Facebook, those reviews are considered less valid then Google, Yelp, or TripAdvisor, and then other. So we had several hundred reviews on Zillow, who is a competitor of mine now, and they decided to get rid of some of our reviews. So we start, yes, they can do that. Christine, I saw your mouth. They can go in and they can wipe out reviews and say, oh, these, we think these are too old or they're not relevant anymore, okay? So we will always want them on Google. 
And you know what, out of 360 reviews, I've got maybe two trolls. And so they're always gonna knock down your rating just a little bit because you're gonna have those people that just do that. My marketing guy says that the consumer is less likely to believe a five-star review if you're consistently five rather than if you're 4.9. So I, I, I'm not ashamed of 4.9 at all. Then you wanna take a look and say, did I, am I using Google local services ad? Am I Google screened? I don't know if you've gone through this process. They actually use Lloyd's of London to go ahead and uh, check you out. You have to put in social security, you have to give them information, but they actually verify you. So as well as on the top of a website, when somebody looks for Casa Grande Realtors and you can see Google screened right here, you can also see how we rate as far as reviews. And if you're tracking your business, you're gonna see more and more reviews um, driving business to your site. So do you have a system for that? Most people don't. When somebody says to us, oh, thank you so much during the transaction, we say, thank you for noticing the kind of service that we provide. I'm glad it's something that you know really makes you happy. And of course, we're gonna in invite some referrals. But when they say that, I'm going to say, I, you know, one of the things you could really do for us at the end of the transaction, our company is going to send you a review link. And we really do want to grow and get better. So if you could take a moment and fill out that review request, that would really be helpful. Automatically, day of closing, this is what our software sends out. Congratulations on your recent purchase. Or if it was a sale, it would say sale. And of course you wanna put your link in, so all they have to do is click on it, right? And go ahead and put in their review. Most times we find that people are very busy around closing. They intended to give us a review, but they just get busy. So two weeks afterwards, if they haven't responded, we send this quick text message. And truthfully, this is where we get a lot of reviews because people intended to do it, they just got busy. So do you have a system? So that, that first request goes out and, and if they don't write that review, then two weeks later, you have a text that goes out. Now, Lisa, thank you for mentioning referring agents because this is something that we really worked on this last year. If you've ever had a situation where you took a referral, somehow they didn't send the referral form and you were on the fly when you were taking the referral and somehow it closes and you didn't send the check. I don't think there's anything more embarrassing than that, right? And it wasn't intentional. So I wanna show you a little system for making sure that you increase those reviews. And I wanna give you an example. This is Robert Little. Robert Little is a CRS out of Las Vegas. This was a recent post um, in one of the referral groups that I belong to. It was that the request was in search of a Las Vegas agent for a seller referral. Who should I recommend? Out of 13 posts here, Robert Little was mentioned 11 times. Do you wanna be that kind of agent for your region? If you do, you gotta have a system for making sure you stay in touch. So this is a, a, an incoming seller referral system. This was a screenshot right out of Top Producer. And you can see that admin runs it. The first thing they do is say, ask the agent if they wanna add a personal message in the thank you card. It doesn't matter if they say no or they don't answer that, thank you card goes out right away. They're already signed, they're ready to go. Print and mail the thank you card check in with the agent for an update. So you can see our admin is running this plan and double checking with the agent. So Christine, are you getting some ideas here? Okay, good. So again, notifying the referring agent when the property's under contract and what the scheduled closing date is, when the inspections and appraisals have cleared, when the property closed and then mailing the check. So you can see we have all of these things. Again, referral incoming buyer pre-contract, what happens? And then here are the actual responses that we've had. We instituted this last summer and the responses that we're getting at closing are amazing. You can see this was from a realtor from Illinois. Um, it was such a pleasant experience, blah, blah, blah. I love this um, one right on the CRS site, find a CRS. I don't know if you have a team 
but I frequently get this question when I get a referral. Are you going to work with them yourself, Debbie, or are you going to pass them off to a team member? Okay. And so I love that Kathleen posted this referral and it was on April. She said, our team is amazing. So basically what she's saying here is the team communicated, had great follow through, provided top of the line service. Okay. So our clients are getting the service. Um, and here's the simple email templates. We're not creating them from scratch. You know, we're pleased to congratulate the client's name on their newly accepted offer. They're scheduled to close on. We'll keep you updated. Um, it's just a series of communication all the way through. At those, the same thing I just showed you, inspection period appraisals, contingencies are met. Down here, we've closed escrow. Thanking them again. And here's, we, your referral check should go out and you should have it by this date. If you haven't received it, let us know. So do you wanna keep referring to me if your clients are receiving this kind of service? If you're getting this communication, you know the client is, right? It looks like I'm already over. Can I keep going, Lisa? I'm almost there. Yes, you can. I may have to move to my phone, but I know we've got a wrapped audience of 20 still here. Sometimes okay. people just, just plan to 230, but please keep going. Okay. An adopted buyer program. Now, sometimes I get pushback when I'm teaching about adopting the buyer of your listings. If you look at the 2021 National Home Buyer and Home Seller Report that NAR does every year and is free for all of our members, you're going to see how many people really intend to work with their client with the same uh, realtor after closing, but how few actually do. And it's because we don't keep in touch. So we adopt the buyers of our listings. And it's very simple, a congratulations card after closing. We send them a VIP letter 14 days after closing. And our VIP form says, here are the services that we provide for you, free facts, free this, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And we invite them to be part of our VIP program. And we're going to send them happy home anniversary cards for 10 years after closing. Often these buyers, come back into us, they thought that they were our client all the way along because they're getting no service from their agent. Lastly, I hope that you are tracking the source of every client, every closing. And so you can see for us, these big gray bars are past clients. You can see that we have reputation, sphere of influence. We're staying in touch. And I think that's how you build a repeatable, profitable business. You track the source of sellers separately from buyers because different things will attract them, right? The same things that attract sellers do not necessarily attract buyers. Those Google reviews are really producing seller leads these days, especially as adult children help aging parents sell a home. Frequently, those adult kids will say, I know you worked with so-and-so later, you know, earlier on in your career, but let's see how they're doing now. And they go on Google to look and see who's active. So I, I really stress those Google reviews right now. We're almost done here. Creating a marketing plan for past clients in Sphere. 33 touches is the goal. And I know that that sounds really high, but if you think about a monthly newsletter, that's 12 touches. If you put in something like a monthly home market valuation, like the home bot, that's another 12. We're getting you to 24. If you do four quarterly market updates where you're just talking about the market, that gets you to 28. Then if you've got a birthday card, or a call that adds another one or two touches, a home purchase anniversary card, that's another, an annual home value update. Then you can add client events, holiday touches. Some people do Popeyes. It's not hard to get to 33 touches if you create a system. And the backbone of that is a monthly newsletter and that monthly home market valuation. Now, I know that a lot of us are excited to be able to get back into events. I want to stress this before we, we pause. So many times people will put it on an event, but they don't take this time 
to have multiple invitations. I talked with someone a couple of weeks ago that put on a beautiful event, but she only invited people once and she had a very low turnout and was disappointed. Here is the system for events. The first one is a mailer. It's kind of like a save the date. Then we send an email reminder. Then we do a Facebook post to that group. Then we do a phone call. And if you don't have time to call everybody, there's systems like slide dial out there. Then there's a video email that goes to them. Then there's a text. And we have the event. Afterwards, we email video and photos and a phone call. And those go to the people that didn't come too. You may have heard this being said, not everybody wants to dance, but they all wanna be invited, okay? So even the people that didn't make it, we respond afterwards. All right, I know I just went blah on all of you. I wanted to give you the opportunity to take my cell, my email again, pull that systems link so that you can go get some freebies. I will stop talking now and answer any questions if there's still anybody on. Oh, we have quite a group on. Thank you so much. I had to jump in my car, but I know, uh, are there any questions? It, just jump in guys, if there are questions. I can't really manage it. Maybe Christine or Nora, if you want to be able to manage the questions um, or anybody just jump in and, and ask a question, please. Debbie, I had a question. It's Marie Presti. Hey, Mary. Marie. How are you? Good. So um, I, I love your, your presentation and um, I, I feel that I've done a lot of, not all, but a lot of the things that you're recommending. Uh, one of the questions I had has to do with your buyer adoption program that you did. And I always thought, and I'm, I'm hoping I'm wrong, but I always thought that by targeting and marketing the other client's buyer, that that was against the code of ethics yeah. because I'm not supposed to try to steal somebody else's client. So I'm a little nervous about doing that, but I love that idea. And I would love to hear if you've investigated that with NAR, if there was any anything written up about the fact that we can do that because sure. it is yeah. after the transaction, but it is still their client as in my eyes. So agency ends at the close of escrow. Okay, so I'm not reaching out to them prior to closing. Okay, and in my marketplace of about 500 realtors, I know five that will stay in touch with their clients afterwards. So I don't do that, okay? But that's the truth. Less than 10% of people will stay in touch with their clients afterwards. So the first thing you is- You don't target those five buyers. I, I know that they're gonna serve their clients afterwards, right? Okay. So I, I, don't, I don't, we don't do it for them. But it, it starts with that simple thank you card congratulations on their purchase card. And then the invitation is very soft after that, the, the first message that goes out at 14 days. Although we didn't represent you in the purchase of this home, we do know the home well. If there's anything we can do to help you, please reach out. And we're inviting you to be part of our VIP club. It's not a hard sell at all, it's an invitation. And I appreciate the question about ethics. It is ethical to reach out to them afterwards because agency ends at the closing. Did that help? Yes, it did. Thank you very much. You bet. That's Other it. questions? Oh, I bet they're... Oh, Cheryl, go ahead and jump in, Cheryl. Hi, Debbie. So good to see you Hi. again. I wrote in the chat so everybody could see that I saw you in celebration, my very first, I think, time at celebration when we were in Florida. And um, you got up and said, when I got back in and decided to plug in again, I had to use systems and systems keep you sane. And um, everybody was like writing as best as they could. And um, it was standing room only if I didn't say that already. And I was impressed then and I've been a fan since then. So um, I have your systems and I, my problem is I have, a, I have a trouble like plugging in. So I really need like, like that marketing team or that virtual assistant team. Do, is that what you had to do or did you have hire people like um, physical people come into your office to manage it for you? Question one. That's a great question. So I've been in the business for a long time, 42 years. So my initial people were physical people. Okay. Now I'm lucky enough that I do have some VAs that manage it, just a portion. Like I have a VA that does all of our marketing in Chicago, right? He's in Chicago. I'm in Arizona. So I think that 
if you read the book Rocket Fuel, I don't know if you've ever read that, it talks about two types of people that are necessary. One is the visionary, the second is the implementer. So I'm the visionary. I have the idea of the client experience I want them to receive, but I'm not the implementer. So I believe that the leader, the realtor, this is gonna sound gross, but we vomit our vision. We vomit our vision on our assistant, right? Who ideally should be an SC that's willing to take all of my ideas on this part of a transaction and write them down and try to come up with how we're gonna do it. And if you sat in that class, you know I use a template and it's an Excel spreadsheet and then we just start putting all the things down that we want. And then we figure out how and who else can do it, okay? So um, yes, did I answer your question? Yeah, so that's that's great that it's definitely someone in Chicago. So that answers that question. I'll. I'll drill that down and maybe ask you offline too. Sure. And then the second question I saw like in your email, um, you put coaching. Are you um, starting a coaching program where um, people could sign up and you have like monthly meetings? Um, um, sure, you can. we can talk about that on, offline if you want. I've been an ICF, International Coaching Federation certified coach since 2006. Wow. So, wow. Um, I've been doing it for a long time. So yeah, just, we can talk about that offline. That's where I parked all these samples though, is on my coaching website. It's a blind, blind page. So you have to have the link to find those, but please R and D rip off and duplicate. Okay. Thank you so much. If you come up with something yeah. better, send me the improvement. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Deal. Yeah. Again, that link is on the bottom of the slides and maybe somebody could put that into the chat. Um, that would be great. It's in um, the chat already. It's in the right, chat. Great, thank you. Yeah, or you can thank email you. me, Debbie at Yoast Homes, and I'm happy to share. You know, when I teach, um, I, I share all the systems that we, we use. And people say, why are you sharing your stuff? And it's because less than 10% of people actually implement. They come to class, they have great intentions, they wind up leaving with the smartest book or with great notes, and they don't implement. So one of the things when we teach the eight hour uh, CRS systems will set you free class is we have to work on a time block schedule for you so that you have time set aside to work on these things. You know, that definition of insanity is continuing to do the same things as you've been doing and expecting different results. Yeah, I love that. And, you know, you, you mentioned in the beginning, which still makes my throat close, and that's ridiculous, just three hours a week. You know, can you find, and I mean, for me, I think I would need to do three 30-minute periods a week to start because my throat close is thinking about three hours. But, you know, because we, we all have those things that we're supposed to be doing every day for an hour, and then the day is gone, and we've already, you know, we, we're used to doing urgent, not important, right? Yes. And we never get to the non-urgent important, which is what you, what setting up these systems is. Uh, so, yeah, so I think that time blocking piece is so critical. Um, we'd love to bring you, I know I said, let's plant a bug in the ear of Nora and Shannon, who are uh, president-elect and, and our education chair, both on, um, thank you all to the leadership team for attending today as well. Uh, this has just been amazing, Debbie. Thank you so much. Um, there's plenty of ways to reach you. We hope to see you in a virtual setting sometime soon. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart and everyone that joined and uh, will also be enjoying it um, on our YouTube channel, which will be posted most likely later today and, and maybe tomorrow. So thanks again for everything. It was thank you, pleasure. everyone. Yeah, thank you everyone for taking the time. Please um, don't delete all of our emails that come to you. We've got a great garden party um, scheduled for uh, August 10th. You'll get some more information about that. Uh, Mastermind Mondays are still um, every month. We have amazing guests like Debbie today. And we also have an amazing uh, class with Chris Bird uh, in Newport uh, uh, in, in October. So we've got some stuff coming up for you. We look forward to seeing you at a RRC event soon. And thanks again for your time today. Bye-bye.